Hello, my friends. Welcome. Oh, I'm a little off center, but oh well. Um, welcome back. I'm super excited for uh, this week because we're going over Defender stuff, which is what I do every day. And I wish I could show the, the vast number of things that sort of feed into this, but I'm just trying to give a little introduction to a few of the various working parts. Um, obviously you're more than welcome to reach out to me and talk about this stuff at any time because, uh, I could talk all day about, uh, finding bad, I was going to say bad guys, but I'll think, I think I'll say bad folks because there's, there's some women in, in black hoodies out there too, uh, that are stealing people's data. Um, so yeah, I think we are ready to get started. One second here. Let me get this going. Okay. Ta-da! You know this part. Y'all are your own teacher. I'm just a lady on the internet uh, pointing you at resources and uh, with a slight black hole over here. Uh. Did that? Oh god, it's still there. Did that get it? Okay. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I'm just, uh, collecting resources for you. Uh, obviously I can provide more resources, especially if you want projects or things to do. I include the, all that on my website beyond just, uh, what we cover in class, because that's definitely the stuff you'll need to, uh, get your hands dirty with to actually get a job. But, uh, I'll at least, uh, drop some breadcrumbs, uh, to interesting things along the way. So, onward to this week's lesson on Defender Mindset and Methods. Um, so last week, uh, we hacked ourselves um, as an attacker, uh, just sort of to show sort of what things they look for and uh, how they perform uh, what they do. So this week, we are going to go a little bit over the mindset, which... Uh, yeah, this stuff's kind of boring to me, but I still think it's important to talk about because uh, it's because defenders we are sort of the business's uh, risk mitigation department or one of the large risk mitigation departments, and the business speaks in terms of risk because risk means lost money, and lost money is bad, or and lost downtime, which is also money. I mean, time is money, et cetera, so forth. So. Our job's really important, and so is being able to speak to the business's concerns and how we sort of structure a business to have security fit in and execute its its uh, operation amidst all of the other departments that make uh, a modern IT-based enterprise run. So first, we're going to cover the mindset uh, and sort of the documents that uh, support that mindset in an organization. Then we're going to go over a specific uh, document that's very important, the incident response lifecycle, which is a key part of what the Security Operations Center does every day. And then we're going to actually get our hands dirty or keep our hands clean while we deal with dirty things uh, with some uh, security analysis tools. So let's get started here. So the defender mindset is to make it difficult. You're trying to uh, block them anywhere you can, any way you can, um, without interfering with day-to-day uh, -day operations. You could make a very super duper secure environment uh, with a lot of traditional access controls and make it very difficult to use your network for anything. <laughs> so security is very much a balance between usability and convenience per se of the network, like making it so there isn't so much security that it's hard to get work done, but there's still security in place so that when something bad happens, we have uh, the ability to respond. So um, I talked about this briefly uh, last week with the attackers, but one of the main concepts in security is defense in depth. And basically we're just trying to get as many defenses in line as possible so that the attacker is coming up against them at some point. And, uh, and we, uh, we, we include detection in that as well as prevention, uh, containment, recovery. There's lots of different steps that can be defenses. Um, 
But an organization has to figure that out. And the way they figure that out is uh, broken down into three major controls um, for security. The first is physical controls. And I mean, this is your more like your standard, what you think security person uh, would utilize, n not necessarily an information security or cybersecurity person. And that's literally straight up fences, like a fence around your secure facility. Um, badge readers, so someone has to, you know, uh, swipe their badge to get inside this, this office. Uh, locks, surveillance, all the stuff that is still required in physical reality to keep stuff safe. Um, Next, we've got the part that we'll probably deal with a lot more, and that's, oh, I got my technical controls. Uh, so that's what you're thinking of when you think cybersecurity. We've got our firewalls, we've got routers, switches, uh, VPNs, uh, our proxy uh, to route web traffic for us. We've got uh, antivirus, uh, endpoint detection response, intrusion detection systems, like the laundry list goes on and on and on. And each one has, you know, hopefully a few people working in that department. And uh, so it's, it's, it's a lot of things that we can include as a technical control. Lastly uh, is operational controls. And that's more along the lines of like, the, like standards, operating procedures and agreements and training uh, and sort of the guidelines and the guidance about how you will respond to things, how you will set things up. And uh, we'll, we'll go over that in a little bit, but I just wanted to do a little recap on some of the departments because it's pretty massive. Um, so let me just bring this up here. Oh, not that one yet. So I made a pretty version of uh, a drawing I did, I think in the first class. Um, so in the center here, shining with mystical pink light is uh, what we might call the crown jewels is the name for the uh, sort of when a hacker has supremely compromised your network and they have access to whatever they want, they have achieved or, or have gotten the crown jewels. So we can we can think of uh, in particular three sets of things that might be the access point to reach the crown jewels. Um, but also these are defenses as well. So with the network, we have, um, for example, the firewall. And if you're not super familiar with the term, it's basically what what gets allowed in and what gets allowed out. So um, a business that runs on the internet that isn't using a cloud provider somewhere else, but is utilizing on-premise infrastructure has, has a special zone on the firewall called the DMZ, demilitarized zone, so that it can sit outside of the network and accept incoming requests from customers or whoever the business serves. Um, but it also, everything within the network is protected so that something on the internet can't just reach out and be like, hey, talk to me. The firewall decides who gets to talk. Uh, the VPN is the virtual private network. So that's similar to logging into like your work machine from home. Um, sometimes that's called remote desktop, but a VPN is a little bit more secure because there's usually some sort of cryptographic key exchange that occurs um, rather than just a username password like traditional remote desktop. Um, so you may have multi-factor authentication where you have an app on your phone that generates a pin uh, that's unique to you so that someone couldn't just start entering usernames and passwords on the outside of the internet and just get inside your network. Uh, another one I included here was DLP or data loss prevention. So that is looking at data on the network as it's moving around and seeing, uh, is it getting outside? <laughs> So you, this is often basically like a tagging system where uh, you, you tag your internal company documents with like the level of privacy it should have. And if something is seen leaving the network or going onto a removable disk, uh, like a flash drive or anything along those lines, there's a there's an alert and at least it's documented. Um, but, uh, you know, they can have a team that responds to alerts full time as well. And then on the machine end, what do we got here? Uh, three very important things. I'll start with asset management because this is, uh, 
among any enterprise who are working with, you know, 10,000 plus machines. It's very difficult to keep track of what has what, like literally is like, usually there's a naming convention that sort of uh, guides how workstations are named, laptops, servers, virtual servers, uh, et cetera, and so forth. Switches, routers, everything usually has a naming structure of some kind to make it a little bit easier but then you have to know what's there and what's on it. So often there's change processes. So like every time something gets installed, it requires a change ticket to that asset and it's all linked together and it's a big nightmare, but uh, having that information is super valuable and kind of got to have it, especially for security. So you know what's on what. Um, part of that is uh, patch management. So making sure that when you install something on something, that that thing is ensured to be patched because as I said last week, when those zero days come out, uh, you know, a patch may come out that week, but attackers are going to weaponize it anyway. If they didn't know about it already, they're going to weaponize it now that they have the zero day clearly explained what it does. They're going to find it, create some sort of script or some way to automate the, uh, the uh, execution of it, and they're going to try and find machines that they can use it on. So keeping track of patches uh, is very important. There's also vulnerability management can be part of that, where you have vulnerability scanners testing vulnerabilities, like testing the actual payloads of the, of the vulnerable um, software to see if the response comes back and is it the vulnerable response or is it the patched response? <laughs> So um, you can tie that in with patch management as well. Lastly, we've got configuration management. Also super important because uh, a lot of times insecurity is introduced simply by bad configurations. So a lot of times rather than once you've detected something and maybe you look back and you're like, ah, well, this wasn't configured correctly so that uh, we could have prevented this altogether. And so a configuration management team is going to sort of keep they call golden images, which is like an image of when a, when a machine comes online to the network, it's at its baseline. Like it's got all the security controls already built in, everything's all set up and it's ready to log onto the network and get assigned, uh, you know, network credentials or an IP or something along those lines. But the configuration management team handles all that. And then also keeping those configurations updated. Um, a primary aspect of that is with uh, Active Directory in Windows environments with group policy um, is a configuration management sort of distribution tool. So lastly, on the people side, um, what I just mentioned, identity and access management over here, IAM, and that's, you know, configuration, but it's also sort of the the architecture of how you've broken out uh, users, roles, and permissions so that uh, you segment your network enough so that not every user should have access to everything. So the more you segment your network, um, I think by, by simply doing so, it's already more secure, but then also you can monitor more heavily the things with administrative accounts and admi administrative powers so that 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 activity is easier to look at later or detect upon and see suspicious activity pop out of those logs. Uh, next, we've got email, which is a whole bunch of things. Uh, that's the uh, email server itself, but also the spam controls because uh, spam can be just advertising, but uh, a lot of that can also be malicious spam mal spam and those are you know parts of huge campaigns again when zero days come out you've got those campaigns but those campaigns are pretty much happening constantly so there's usually an email team sort of tracking those patterns and seeing where they can institute controls so it just never reaches an inbox altogether um back in the day you used to be able to just send uh dot scr which is a screensaver file uh you could just send those <laughs> pretty willy nilly and they could actually be an executable that runs and installs a virus. But uh, nowadays, most email programs, if it sees an SCR attachment, it's just going to throw it out. It's such a old hat maneuver that uh, now most email providers even take those out. Uh, and then lastly, over here, I've got security awareness, um, which uh, 
is super important. Like our users are going to be an access point and an infection vector into our network. And we can't rely on automated tools all the time. Um, there is a human element of security that can be exploited. So training our employees to be more security minded is going to help the organization altogether. And then let's just take a quick look at how the SOC works. So that's the Security Operations Center. And they get all the alerts, lots of alerts for the SOC. And when they get alerts, they often loop in a bunch of other teams to help them do their job. Sometimes it depends on how the organization is organized. And sometimes a SOC analyst will do all of these things. But uh, for example, we could be f uh, feeding what gets alerted into a machine learning system so that we see patterns or the our, our machine learning system will begin to see patterns of what sort of detections are in our network. And especially when they get confirmed to be bad, now we're, we're more, we know that this detection is more reliable. And so it can use that pattern to uh, see it in the future. Incident response, they're sort of making sure that we follow the incident response lifecycle, getting the business back to clean as quickly as possible. And we'll go over the incident response life cycle in a moment. Uh, next is the forensics team. Uh, they can sort of dig a little bit deeper into the artifacts left on the machine. They can often find new indicators of compromise, uh, which are either IP addresses, domains uh, to websites, or maybe a hash of a file or some sort of activity pattern they witnessed. All of these we can use to uh, make new alerts. And uh, same with malware. Uh, if they, if on the machine there is found an executable that's malicious, send that over to the malware team. They're going to pick it apart and uh, see if they can find any additional indicators of compromise, especially if it didn't execute. Sometimes you're able to, you know, your, your products find malware, prevent from executing, but it could have executed somewhere else. So if you pull indicators of compromise out of a, a malware, then you can search your environment and make sure that maybe before that detection came up in the last 30 days, you didn't get infected before you knew about it. Um, and we'll, we'll do some live malware, some dynamic malware analysis uh, near the end here. And then lastly, we got threat intelligence. So they are often sort of seeking out patterns of what attackers are doing here and there, and then uh, trying to get those fed into alerts uh, as quickly as possible so the SOC can detect things uh, as the threat actors are developing their own techniques. So all of these are feeding back into the alert framework. And then what are the alerts made out of? So that is all our logs. So here we've got event logs. Those are Windows and Linux logs um, or Mac, uh, which is a flavor. Uh, intrusion detection system. This looks at network traffic and tries to identify strange or suspicious patterns. Endpoint detection and response. One of my favorite things because there's just so much good data in there. Um, we will go over um, an enterprise tool for EDR uh, near the end here. I'm super excited. I have an educational license to do whatever I wish. And then uh, antivirus, uh, your traditional AV. And then uh, the proxy is an excellent source of information because that's tracking every call to the internet first goes through the proxy and the proxy decides, do I block this or allow this based off of categorizations of the website on the other side. But uh, you can't categorize everything on the internet, so a lot of times the category is none. But then that becomes an interesting place to check when uh, a machine has been behaving badly. Uh, what has it been connecting out to? Let's check the proxy logs. So those are just some of the logs that feed into our alerts. And then all of these teams are contributing to make these alerts better and better as the uh, security organization just has more cycles to spend on better detections, as well as looking at actual threats that have reached inside of the network. All right, back to slides. Uh, so yeah, we doodled it. Uh, so yeah, the boring part, but very important is the operational documents that sort of guide how a business responds and prepares uh, their security organization. So 
Uh, this can get pretty confusing, but after you've seen a few, you'll, you'll sort of get the idea. And we'll, we'll look at one kind of briefly. A policy is just an over, oh, overarching principles for decision making down the line. So you're not having the nitty gritty of how you set up your servers or your machines. You're just saying, uh, we are going to have as many logs as possible. That's kind of general. You can probably have a better one than that. Um, I would say, uh, one level of policy might be, uh, I'll just pop up notepad just so we can see here. One level of policy might be, uh, we will log all administrative logons. And that's, that's a good policy, but it's, uh, it doesn't have, maybe, maybe we can make it more specific as we will copy paste and store in a centralized location for, uh, ingestion into our security team products. That's a little bit better. Now we know that <laughs> if we were just logging all of it, you could have all of your logs on every machine in your environment, but it is a nightmare to look manually uh, one by one on each machine rather than storing in one place so that we can have our security team look at all the logs all at once. So policy can shift and change, but the idea is just overarching principles to guide the uh, the creation and uh, maintenance and upkeep of security. And yes, as Plop says, plus attackers do kill local logs. So if you have logs forwarded immediately to a centralized location, then it's ingested there and stored there. Uh, and the attackers likely don't have access, hopefully don't have access to your secured, uh, well-provisioned with well-defined access roles server that stores all this information. Uh, next, we've got the standard. So these are sort of like what you have to have in place, ideally to kind of meet the policy. If we're saying uh, we'll, we'll store all administrative logs, the standard will be to enable this log, enable this log, enable this log. And maybe there's more logging available, but that's where we might look at the guidelines. So next we've got procedures. These are the step-by-step -step instructions. Uh, this could be for an employee. It could be, um, you know, like an employee that just utilizes the service, but it could also be procedures for the technical folks that are setting up the infrastructure, um, especially if it's a kind of thing that has to happen over and over. Um, and it, you can institute a procedure so that someone is making sure to follow policy if you force them to follow this procedure to like reach a server that can come onto the corporate network, it has to have gone through all these steps. And so you can insert a bunch of steps in that procedure so that you're living up to your policy and enacting your standards. Uh, and lastly, a guideline is non-mandatory best practices. So they're just things to keep in mind. And ideally you want to, you know, have best practices altogether, but it, it may not be feasible, uh, you know, just across the board. So we will go over a guideline momentarily while looking at the incident response life cycle. Uh, so the idea is with the reason it's a life cycle is because we are endlessly iterating and constantly improving. Security is not stagnant. You are always going to be learning and need to learn more new things because uh, the threats are changing, your environment's changing, and uh, it, requ it requires a sort of a bird's eye view of what's going on to, uh, you know, best do the security job. So there's a few different ways to break up this uh, the, the phases of the incident response life cycle. I sort of adapted this one because I think it's kind of would make more sense. We'll, we'll go over two of the regular ones, but um, I made a four phase life cycle. There's a five phase and there's a six phase out there. Um, but I think this works well. Let's say we start with learn and prepare. So that, I mean, we could say we learn to set up our security policies. And then we, you know, enacted our standards and then we set up our network according to those standards with procedures. And, um, that is how we prepared for threats. And, you know, you kind of have to wait for a threat to show up to, uh, engage the other parts of the, uh, life cycle, but that's the steps you're at. Uh, next is detect and report. So this is where you're actually detecting something possibly bad happening. Um, 
Usually this is utilizing a SIM, a Security Information Event Manager, uh, which we'll go over in a little bit. But um, the idea is that you have some way to automatically detect when things are happening and it reports to someone that is actually going to respond to it. It's not just, you know, a detection and just store it in a file somewhere um, that you look at at the end of the month. The idea is to have this this cycle as soon as the possibility to detect an attacker occurs, you've got someone looking to see if that's true or not. And then, um, you know, a lot of times uh, what's in those reports is not going to be an attacker. But sometimes it is. And when it is, you're going to have to move down into triage and analyze. And that's where you're like, uh-oh, this looks bad. Uh, that's this is really engaging the incident responders, possibly forensics, malware, threat intel. Uh, you're sort of rallying the troops to look at what you found and triage it. Make sure that that thing cannot spread further. Um, yeah, I mean, there's 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 reasons to not immediately contain a machine because a lot of times enterprise will have a tool to just contain a machine so that it can't talk to anything else except for you and you can just request things from it so you can analyze further. But sometimes you might actually want to see what they're doing just to get an idea because the more they do, you're sort of, they're exposing the techniques they perform when they've gotten onto a net network and every technique they perform is going to be ammo for you to use um, as a detection uh, or a preventative control. So um, ideally you usually just contain that thing and make sure that the threat is neutralized as quickly as possible. And then you analyze the things you can learn from it so that it doesn't happen again. So, but you, you just document all that in a ticket and you're, you're building this incident response report as you investigate and you build up all this analysis so that the business has documentation as to what happened. And then after you've triaged things, then we move into contain and recover. So now, made sure to make sure it can't talk to anything else. Uh, and, but we don't necessarily know everything that the attacker did. Uh, but if we look at that system, analyze other systems it touched and sort of get an idea for how far it was able to spread, usually you just re-image those things because you don't know for certain that if you, are you like, oh, I deleted the malware, it made a registry key and I got rid of the registry key, it's fine. I mean, maybe, but uh, not worth risking the business uh, and thinking you have solved it when you haven't. So oftentimes that's a full recovery and you just re-image the machine altogether. And that again goes back to the configuration management folks who have a lovely golden image to just re-image your machine. And uh, then we sort of move into, uh, I, I compared the learn or I, I combined the learn and prepare step. Oftentimes learn will be last in this cycle and then you move to preparation. But I think you can combine them because uh, lessons learned is where you've got the incident report You've got all these indicators of compromise that you're going to look in your environment and make sure they can't uh, execute or uh, connect to any any further. And uh, yeah, then you move right back into learning and preparing your machines again. So the idea is every time an incident happens, uh, your security is getting better because you're, you're learning from what uh, you found during your analysis and then making sure that can't happen again, or you'll make sure to find it quicker in an earlier part of the attack. Uh, you know, in, in one of those stages of defense in depth, maybe you could find it a lot earlier if you had a detection that worked on an earlier source. So, uh, we can look real briefly. How am I doing on time? I can't tell. Ah, not too bad, but I should go quicker. Uh, so NIST 861, that's the National Institute of Science and Technology. They've devised this uh, incident response protocol, um, which is just a little bit different. Uh, 861, if we look at theirs, they've got preparation, detection and analysis, containment, eradication, recovery, and then post-incident activity, and then loop back right to preparation. So theirs is a little bit different. We've also got SANS Pickerel, 
Um, this is the first one I was introduced to, and that's preparation, identification, containment, eradication, recovery, and lessons learned. And then you feed the lessons learned right back into preparation and you're incident responding again. So I won't go any further into that, even though there's lots of interesting stuff there. Um, but that's sort of like the, the documents and policy that guide how cybersecurity is integrated into the business in the larger picture. So lastly, let's just look at some tools. So these are some of the things we get to use in the day to day as a security person that I think are super cool. This is where I spent all my time is building new detections for all of these tools and finding the way to, uh, to yes, scratch mechanics. I, I, I post all of this to YouTube afterwards. It's also will be on the Twitch VOD and I save a highlight. You can check it all out later. And uh, yeah, thank you for joining us. I'm super excited. I've got a bunch of classes uh, in the past month and a half and I got a few more coming up. Uh, so uh, analysis tools, let's move on to the first one. Thanks Scratch Mechanics, happy to have you. Uh, the first one is my favorite is endpoint detection and response. So some examples of this are these three tools here, Carbon Black Response, CrowdStrike, and Microsoft ATP. Basically what this is, when I, press control shift escape. You might be familiar with this when you press control alt delete to end a process. If something's hanging and broken, um, you, you have these list of processes. So all of these are things running on your machine, but this doesn't give you a ton of information about what exactly are they doing. And so that's what EDR is for. So let me briefly, I swear. So this is, uh, Carbon Black Response Console. Um, thanks to my lovely friends there, I might need to re-log in. Yes, I do. Uh, so basically, I just have my machine, this laptop I'm working on right now, is sending all of its process logs and information to uh, Oh yeah, plops, control shift escape. It's, it saves you two clicks, man. So much better. Um, so this is sending all of the logs about what my processes are doing on my machine, machine to this centralized uh, server. So if I put in my host name, I can see all 59,000 processes in the past three days. So Firefox, Spotify, et cetera, so far. Here's Streamlabs running right now. <laughs> um, but the idea is with these tools to have things that are constantly looking um, for badness. So this one is, for example, looking for a ransomware file artifact. So we have a bunch of feeds. There's just there's 247 detections in just this feed alone. And I think there's about 700 or 800 total with uh, Carbon Black Response. But it's basically looking for this query at all times. So if it sees a file modification to the startup folder and it ends in .dll.link, that could be ransomware. Um, there are a ton of these and I don't want to uh, just endlessly go through those, but just an idea is, uh, let's say I wanted to see, well, I don't run PowerShell very often on my host machine. So uh, what what's my mach machine been up to? Oh my gosh, that's a lot of PowerShell. What's happening? Well, if we dig into one of these, oh my God, not only is PowerShell running, look at this command line, download bad file. Oh no. Well, then we can dive into the, the process tree here. And now we're sort of getting a, a breakdown of how what this process got up to. You can see every file mod, uh, DLL load, child processes it created, et cetera, so forth for just this process. But then I can navigate up and down the tree to see where did this come from? Uh, so what's S office? Oh, I'm looking at the command line here that's in program files. Oh, this is LibreOffice. Oh, and it looks like it opened a file called totally harmless file.ods but then spawned PowerShell. Now that just doesn't seem, uh, doesn't seem right. So, I mean, I just wanted to show this a little bit. I would love, I'm, 
in the future, I'm going to be doing a, a full episode just on EDR because it's so cool. And uh, But uh, we got to get going and move on to the next thing here. So the next thing I've got on the list is, and that was Carbon Black Response I was showing you. Unfortunately, I haven't heard of great uh, open source EDR, but uh, there's one called Wazoo uh, that you can look up and play with. And granted, there are other ways to build what an EDR does with regular just logs, but it's a little bit more effort to get it going. Uh, next is the security information and event management tool. And uh, my preference is Splunk because it's very powerful. You can do all sorts of things with its uh, processing language. Uh, ArcSight is another popular one uh, that was one of the first tools on the market. And then IBM has one called QRadar. But basically, this is just a place to shoot all of your logs so that when an analyst uh, wants to sort of respond to things, not only do they just have to look at the sim, then they can pivot to those things for further logs if they need to look at a workstation or its network traffic and it's not all in the sim. The idea is just to, to bring as many things as possible into one engine so that you can cross-correlate uh, across IPs, uh, machine names, file modifications, web requests, etc. The more information you have in your sim, the more able you're able to find the sources of things across your entire environment rather than looking, you know, place to place to place to place. So uh, I wish I had more time to show and I spent three hours trying to get Boss of the Sock to work. Uh, I will get it working by next week. But uh, I just wanted to show uh, Splunk's security data sets project. So if you Google for Splunk security data set project, you will find uh, a little sign up sheet to to get this. I'll show you because it looks weird. Um, I think because it's such an old page, it loads real badly. And maybe this is just my machine. But if you fill in all this information and then click submit, eventually they'll email you a link to log on to this server. And then eventually next week, I will have a live uh, Boss of the Sock instance so you can try and find uh, the badness. But regardless, if you get access to their instance, it has a walkthrough for, for the sort of the premise of why what you're doing and how you're investigating this alert. So uh, this is a really great thing just to follow along and enter all the commands yourself just to get an idea of how Splunk works. So Splunk can do all sorts of things, but its primary uh, interface is the search tab. So it looks like this, and it's got it's got a language to talk to it, to pull back what you're looking for. So in this case, they wanted to find who's talking to I'm really not Batman. Uh, you're working for Bruce Industries and finding where, where the badness came in. So you give it an index so it knows where to look, uh, and then you're looking for this site. So this is retor returning all sorts of what they call key value pairs. This is basically what makes up a database, um, a relational database uh, like Postgres or Mongo or uh, et cetera, so forth. Um, but what that allows you to do is pivot off of useful things. So in this case, we've got four source types that happen to include I'm really not Batman. Uh, we've got the firewall. We've got the web server, the Microsoft IIS web server. We've got HTTP traffic, and we've got Suricata, our IDS, all hit having instances of seeing I'm really not Batman.com. Uh, what I really like doing when I'm not familiar with a data set is do a count by the source types, and then I get all the information about what this index is actually searching. So I see Windows event logs, I see the Windows registry, more sysmon logs, which is an event log, uh, firewall stuff, web server, vulnerability scanner, streams of various network protocols, and yeah, looks like that's it. Oh, we've got another page of stuff, another stream, and then Suricata the IDS. So that sort of orients me to like, what information do I have available at my fingertips? But the idea is with Splunk, you could make it so, uh, where's, so in this case, 
they want to see who who is looking for I'm really not Batman.com. Uh, source IP. So wow, this one source IP is talking a lot. Uh, so it looks like we've got two. And uh, we can investigate a little bit further. But I just wanted to sort of show that uh, we Splunk right here, our sim in this case. This is a lot of counts. And I know just from experience, this, is, this IP is brute forcing a password. Now granted, you should have a standard so that you can't just brute force a password and just keep submitting new passwords. But um, if that's not possible in your environment, maybe you could just make an alert so when Splunk sees um, from one source IP a count over, geez, 20, uh, send me an alert because that is probably brute force. So then it just becomes a matter of, you know, onboarding additional detections and more detections and more detections. And obviously you try to make them a little bit broad so you can, you can find multiple ways that bad things can happen in your environment. But that's the great thing about a sim. You're looking at all your machines and finding uh, every instance of that happening thanks to your centralized logging in, let's say, Splunk, even though that's really expansive. Um, but uh, yeah, that's the idea of a sim. Okay, I'm going to hurry through. There's just one more thing. Uh, the last thing I wanted to show was a malware sandbox. And that is basically a place to safely blow stuff up. <laughs> um, because, uh, you know, malware authors are often very, very clever. Um, they hide the indicators of compromise that you want to find so that you can block them all together. They'll hide it within layers and layers of obfuscation and, and subroutines that, like, keep it from being exposed to the machine there there are uh there is malware that checks to see am i in a sandbox <laughs> and if i am in a sandbox don't execute or execute this other thing that doesn't look quite as malicious while keeping the actual payload secret so that that payload doesn't spread to the, the wider security community and get known as something to look for so these are really cool. Um, my favorite is at the top here, any.run. And I'll just show you, there's a common banking Trojan called Emotet. Um, and here's an example of Emotet. And it's, wow, didn't do much. The great thing about any.run is it shows a video of what happens when you execute it. So it's this video has two parts. But we don't really see much happen on the machine. But... It also basically has EDR running at the same time. And it's like, hey, this executable right here, um, more info, uh, starts itself from another location. Oh, that's weird. Oh, it came from Portable Device Connect API. So you plug it in, and then this executable just ran immediately. And then executable content was dropped and overwritten. Uh, so then it ends up writing a new executable. So that's all interesting. It could also show registry changes, network requests, uh, so on and so forth. But then if we look at XML Pro-V, um, the thing that it dropped, uh, we see changes in the auto run value in the registry. Uh, detected Emotet connects to a command and control server, uh, connects to a server without a host name. Like if it's just reaching out to an IP and not like www.imgoinghere.com and it reads internet cache settings. So we can you know, look, oh, it adds itself uh, as part of the uh, Windows startup so that every time the the machine runs, even if antivirus kills it, it'll just start it up again. And there are more advanced versions of those techniques. It's not all that simple and there's ways to get around it. But that's one sandbox. There's another cool sandbox called Intezer. And the thing I like about Intezer is it's basically classifying malware families. So it's looking at pieces of code that are unique, but then comparing pieces of the code, not just the file hash, which is all the code altogether, and you change one letter on that and the hash completely changes, which is why traditional antivirus doesn't really work anymore. Um, this analyzes, breaks out the executable into p like function calls and variable calls, and then analyzes where those function calls and variable calls have been seen before. So if some new malware author takes the base emotet and adds a few tricky things that they thought would be cool to add, 
you throw it into Intezer and it'll be like, well, this shares a lot of, uh, a lot of strings with Emotet, but there are some unique strings I haven't seen before. Uh, so that's a, uh, these two are my favorite. I, I love any.run and Intezer, and they're both free. So you can just create a free account and you can throw, you can upload malware to it <laughs> and they'll test it. Uh, obviously you don't want to execute the malware on your own machine. Do not execute malware on your own machine. <laughs> Uh, and then the last one I mentioned here was Cuckoo, which is an open source, uh, sandbox that you can sort of set up your own instance on, on your own, uh, network and you can throw malware at it and see what happens. And it will try to pull out indicators of compromise. I don't find it quite as complex and cool as any.run or Intezer, but you can, you know, set it up yourself and run it on your own network to play with. So... I'm just barely squeezing in under the radar here. Uh, we'll do a quick recap with the quiz. Uh, so for newcomers, there's a quiz. And it is not graded, but you you gain glory um, and the envy of all of your peers when you reach those leaderboards. So you're just going to go to kahoot.it. Uh, and then enter this code right here, 113673, and that will get you in. Just a reminder for, for folks, the answers themselves will be on my screen, on the Twitch, uh, on your phone or your laptop or web browser, whatever you're, you're looking at this with. Uh, it will just show little sim colored symbols that will relate to the answers on the screen. So... Y'all hop in there. Oh, Scratch Mechanic, first come, first serve. Oh, Nagihama's back. Someone's trying to SQL inject. <laughs> and get, uh... Oh, no, Scratch. The fact that you're here is a success. Um... So C wanted to look really cool and have a big name. <laughs> But uh, maybe next time, see, you're going to have to try a few different injections to get the code to work. <laughs> uh, cool. All right, we got four. Surprised my mom isn't here. Mom, are you not attending class on Father's Day? Unacceptable. Oh, we lost. We lost C. Oh, are they going to try a different injection? <laughs> uh, oh, yeah, it's all right, Alex. We will... Uh, I'm sure it's all, it's all, the knowledge is inside of you. You just have to withdraw it into your consciousness. Um, oh, no, sorry. Well, B, it's, it's just B. That's all it's going to be, B. Uh, all right. I just run it for uh, 10 more seconds. Which, well, I did both thumbs. Ugh, this is hard to do. Oh, there's the thumb. Boop. Uh, uh. Okay, that's that's all of the fingers. Oh no, B, we lost you. Was my finger count too long? I think you can still join while it's going. Uh, so first question. I think this is a multi-select, so worth extra points. Uh, what are some physical security controls? They're physical. Uh, is that uh, le cameras, uh, le firewall, an employee agreement, very powerful piece of paper in the physical universe, and ID cards. I mean, technically, all of these are physical things, I think. Not, uh, but yes, those are the two main things there. I mean... The firewall is more, it, it, it can, it is a physical piece of hardware, but it is a technical control. It needs to be configured and, you know, uh, has those capabilities. The employee agreement is an operational control because you're having the employee read it and understand how things work so that the operation becomes more secure. All right, Alex and Negihama on the board. Oh, B and C. <laughs> okay. 
Uh, what organization releases the 861 security guidelines? Ooh, I only said it once. I meant to uh, say it more than once. But it... It's not... Uh, it's not nasty. Yeah, it's NIST. Yeah. So, uh, Sans has Pickerel. Um, NIST has the 861 guidelines. All right, scratches on the board. All right. I, I believed in you the whole time. Uh, the incident response cycle varies wildly. It's always different. Everyone does it completely different. There's nothing in common. It's, it's all just people trying to figure things out. Yeah, that's, that's false. I mean, the, there is variation, but the, the wi widely, oh, I meant wild, wildly, but, uh, the, the basic premise of the phases of the preparation, uh, detect, respond, uh, contain, triage, recovery, and then lessons learned, uh, post-incident report stuff. So they, they all file some sort of cycle like that. Oh, Negahama popping up. All right, this one's the puzzle. Everyone hates these. <laughs> uh, order of a standard IR life cycle. Oh, funny enough, we just talked about that. Oh, I'm kind of in the way. The last one there is... Uh, so you've got prepare, detect, contain, and learn. I mean, that sounds kind of logical. You gotta prepare. Uh, you gotta detect. Yeah, this one actually, it's supposed to randomize the order of the responses, and it just gave it to you all in the correct order. <laughs> uh, but Scratch got it! All right! Yeah, those ones, those ones are tough. The best way to understand malware is to watch it carefully and run directly on your machine. I mean, you gotta figure it out. And the best way to do it is <laughs> not on your own machine. Please, please don't run malware. Please don't test malware on your own machine. A lot of times, you know, parts of it don't work because they're connecting to infrastructure that has been taken down. But you never know. Oftentimes they have multiple sets of infrastructure, so there might be a really, really old one that uh, still works. Uh, another multiple selection. I'm going to be in the way. I can't move. Okay, there we go. So what are some log sources for a sim? Event logs? Intrusion detection system logs? Physical access logs? Endpoint logs? They're all logs. Isn't that what a sim is for? It's for logs? Pretty sure that's where you put your logs, right? Ah, I tried to trick you with the physical access logs because those are actually really good to have in your sim. Uh, because uh, it does sound like a, you know, something you, you might not include. But those can tell you if a user is in the building, for example. If, if, there's, if there's an access log of their badge going in and then their computer turning on, that makes a lot more sense. Or, or a, a VPN connection and, and uh, no v physical access log, that gives you a little bit clue about their behavior. So I was trying to trick you, i sorry. Uh, it's better to perfect one security solution than to utilize a whole bunch. Like, I mean, why have all these controls where you can just have one good one? And yeah, the idea on the defender side especially is defense in depth. We want as many controls as possible all the way down the line. All right, we got a bunch of people on the board. Number eight, I think this is a multi-select. Yep, uh-huh, uh-huh. I'll try and be out of the way for that corner answer. So what are some operational controls? Uh, security awareness training? Incident response? A firewall? Or a badge reader? Hmm. 
Definitely want all of those things. But are they operational controls? Yeah, this one you can argue a little bit. Uh, you, you, these are the types of trick questions they'll put on the Security Plus exam. Um, but operationally, uh, these are more like, this is like something the user goes through to learn about how operations works. Incident response, again, is a process of how to do the security thing. Badge readers, I could see how they would be operational. Technically, it's a physical thing then, and I would imagine in your employee agreement, it would say, which is, an, which is the operational control, it says you must badge in. But the badge reader itself is a physical control. And again, the firewall could argue it's physical, but ultimately it's a technical control because it is somehow managing and routing the, the internet and network traffic to, to perform security. So we've got these two is operational, badge reader is physical, and firewall is technical. Whoa, Scratch Mechanic coming in from behind. Oh, wow. He could take it with this true and false. Are standards mandatory controls? Or are they just like, well, you probably should do the standard. Maybe. Yeah. Oh, everyone got that one. Hoo-wee. That was a close one. Oh, and C got on the board. Hey, welcome. All right, last one, just a poll. I'm curious what people think. I'm trying to get out of the way. Which part of the defender mindset is most interesting to, to you? Threat intelligence, forensics, detection and response, or pattern analysis? We didn't really talk about that, but that's kind of what I do. I like finding the patterns and then detecting on those in the future. Oh yeah, we got a pretty even split and oh yes, you pattern folks, I, I get it. Data has so much information. You can make data about your data and metadata about your metadata and you can just learn so many new things. All right. So I believe third place, we've got to Alex. Blah, 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 blah. Number two, scratch, silver, silver medal, baby. And right on top, our friend Negihama back again to claim her throne. Awesome. Thank you everybody for joining. Um, so as usual, uh, just wrapping up here because uh, as usual, I took up all the time. Uh, and just a reminder for next week, I do intend to talk with you people. I want to talk with you. So if you would like to talk with me and uh, talk amongst ourselves, uh, that is the idea for our next class. We're just going to do a quick overview of some security news, just like maybe 10, 15 minutes. I swear, I swear 10 to 15 minutes. And then I kind of want to just talk to people and see where they're at and see what sort of questions come up. So that'll be next week. Um, but in the meantime, uh, I haven't updated this page, but I will very shortly. Um, you can you can see the links at seventhdirectioncom slash curriculum. That first link will be for the Splunk Security Datasets project, so you can go through their walkthrough and see how you would utilize Splunk to find attacker behavior and patterns. And then if you go through that, I'm also going to have Boss of the Sox set up next week so that you can go through the questions and uh, try and answer them and see if you can... Uh, I mean, that walkthrough gives you a decent amount of the answers, but uh, not, not exactly. Um, they're a little bit different. Uh, next, I'll link the SANS community posters. These are great. Uh, I still reference these from time to time. Uh, basically, they're a bunch of forensic artifacts uh, and, and ways that the Windows operating system works so that you can find anomalies uh, in your Windows machines. And lastly, yes, as Scratch Mechanics has mentioned, Professor Messer is the one of the dopest human beings on the planet. Um, his his training courses, uh, he has one for all three CompTIA certs, the A+, the Network+, and the Security+, which I have recommended in the past. I definitely do recommend. I didn't have enough money at the time to uh, pay for all three certs, so I just got the Security+, Plus, but I did go through the A+, course and the Network+, Plus course with Professor Messer, made outlines, did flashcards, all that stuff. So I made sure to know that material because it is really important to know. 
Um, but the Security Plus is the uh, gold standard slash lowest bar to get into security. And uh, it's, it's a definite requirement that you should be going towards it. So I wanted to introduce his content now because um, it's, a, it's a great overview of the various things we've talked about, about how a security organization works. And uh, you're going to need that certification at some point. So, you know, getting started on his classes and make sure you take notes and make outlines and stuff, because that's going to help you study uh, a lot more than just watching the videos all over again. But looks like we have reached 6 p.m. And that is that, y'all, I think. Again, uh, yes, Scratch, thank you for joining us for the first time. And if there were any others, uh, you are also super welcome. And looking forward to next week where we might chat with each other and be friends. Um, I have a Discord that I believe I have worked out the audio uh, uh, setup so that we can all talk to each other. And uh, yeah, Scratch, this is every Sunday at 5 p.m. Um, uh, for the foreseeable future, I think I'm going to take a, a month break at the end of this sort of package of content and then come back with three more months and then month break, three more months and back and forth. But uh, it's all on Twitch and on the YouTubes and uh, 5 p.m. Pacific time. But uh, yeah, happy to have you and looking forward to chatting with some of y'all next week. Have an excellent day, my friends. Bye bye. Bye bye. Adios. Sayonara.